So thank you, Vida. And um, thank you all for being here. And thank you to the people, the Zoomers, also for being there. Look, I mean, so I'm in Toronto and Toronto feels like home. So it's really a great pleasure to just be able to talk to you and introduce the research that we do in the group. I'll be here for a few months. So help me go to a highly non-equilibrium place. Talk to me about what you're talking, what, what are you thinking, your desires in, in terms of science. Uh, I'm really, really happy to, to talk. Okay. So I would like to um, just say that I, essentially I'm across the lake from you. No? In, uh, in, in Rochester, it's almost, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's really just south of here. And um, this is the University of Rochester right here. This is the Lake Genesee, that's the city of Rochester. And that blue thing in the in, at the end is Lake Ontario. That's what divides us between Toronto and Rochester. Technically, we are the land of the Kodak moment for those of you that are old enough to um, get the, 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 the idea. Okay. So let me just start with, an, with, with something that I know many people in this room care about, which is um, quantum mechanics and chemistry. So molecules are pretty amazing quantum systems. No? They have manifolds of transitions in many regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, the energy levels can be chemically tuned. They can be assembled into complex architectures. And for this reason, you can, in principle, um, do quantum operations in a variety of time scales and control them chemically. And um, ever since the inception of quantum mechanics, um, there has been a dream in the chemistry community of, of, of how do we use quantum coherence and other non-trivial quantum mechanical effects to enhance molecular function. And that dream has taken many forms over the years. This is a, 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 a book by Paul summarizing his ideas in this context. This is a more recent review and so on and so forth. So there has been, it, it, it's a, it's a long standing topic in chemistry. And my group uh, really cares about this idea and we, we work in four different directions uh, right now. We, we, we work in the problem of how do we control matter at the level of electrons using ultra-fast laser sources. Because we have to think about quantum coherence and quantum control, uh, we also have to think about how to protect that quantum coherence. No? So we work a lot on understanding the coherence processes in molecules. Uh, we have to simulate these processes. And for that, we, we work on quantum simulation, both in digital simulation and now in analog quantum simulation. And uh, in a topic that uh, we share with Vera quite heavily, it, it is the idea of quantum transport. So we also work in the theory and the simulation of quantum transport and molecular electronics. And today, what I would like to focus today is on two, what I think emerging topics, the idea that we can use lasers to drive electronics to the petahertz limit. This is about six orders of magnitude faster than the state of the art. And I would like to tell you about our progress in developing tools for quantum simulations, but analog quantum simulation of chemical dynamics in which we map the dynamics of interest into a, quant into a highly controllable quantum hardware. Okay. So let me start with the idea of controlling matter at the level of electrons. Um, so <clears throat> the reason why we focus on electrons is because if you're able to control electrons, you can control the optical properties of matter, the transport properties of matter, and eventually the chemical reactivity. And the reason why we are interested in controlling electrons using coherent laser sources instead of conventional means, and by conventional means, I mean an applied voltage, a thermodynamic or chemical control, is because if you're able to do it with lasers, you are able to do it very fast on a femtosecond time scale. Okay, so it, with this idea in mind over the last 10, nine years or so, we have developed three essential strategies to control electrons in matter. We have developed strategies based on the Floquet engineering in particular of optical property. This is a direction of active research in my group right now. We have developed a general scheme to control electrons across the interfaces based on the Stark effect. The advantage of this scheme is that it's robust to decoherence. And um, the topic that I would like to discuss today is a topic that actually started here for me as a PhD student, uh, which is the, the problem of, of inducing currents along nanojunctions using lasers. And I would like to tell you um, where, are, where are we at that time okay, in, in that topic. Okay, so what's the idea? So you have a um, nanoscale junction. So where you have a metal here, another metal there, and some material in the middle. That material could be a dielectric, it could be a semiconductor, it could be a molecule, it could be a semi-metal. The system is spatially symmetric. There is no bias voltage. And what we're going to do is that we're going to come in with a very special class of laser fields break the spatial symmetry and generate currents. And if we're able to do that, what we'll be able to do is to generate bursts of currents 
on a femtosecond time scale, which is essentially a new current standard. Okay. What are the main physical ingredients? Um, so what you need for this are two things. You need a field, a laser field, that has a low temporal symmetry, and I'll tell you what I mean by this, and you need the nonlinear response of matter to that laser field. And the traditional example, and this is something that was created here in Toronto by, by Paul and, and, and Mosher, is fields that have two frequency components, a field, a, a frequency omega, and its second harmonic, two omega. And now, if you shine this laser field and you look at the nonlinear response, and you, for example, calculate the photoinduced dipoles or the photoinduced currents, and you time average because you want an effect that survives time averaging, the lowest order effect that you get is to the cube of the field. And when you take the third power of that field, what happens is that you get this, what, this phenomenon of harmonic mixing in which these frequency components start to mix. You know? So start, you start getting things like omega plus two omega minus two omega, sorry, omega plus omega minus two omega, and that will give you a zero frequency or a DC component in the response. So it's, this is a type of rectification effect in which the sense in which your drive is an AC source and your response is a DC effect. But very importantly, just by changing these laser phases, uh, the relative phase between the omega and the two omega component, you can um, choose the direction of your symmetry break. You can induce dipoles to the left or to the right. You can induce currents to the left or to the right. Okay. Now, how experiments are done, this is the traditional way, but how experiments are done right now is that they don't use these continuous wave, very long excitations, but they use laser fields that look like this. Um, <clears throat> let's see, where's my mouse? I think I managed to lose it. Okay, they, they use laser fields that look like this. This is the electric field as a function of time. And you see that these are laser fields that are so short that they just have a few cycles in them. You know? And these are called few cycle laser fields. And you can think about them as a, oops, I wish I had my mouse, where did it go? All right, you can think about it as some amplitude f of t, some envelope, and then a cosine function you know, in the middle. And there's a phase of how this envelope is related to that cosine function. And that phase is the carrier, the, what is called the carrier envelope phase. When I was a PhD student, controlling the carrier envelope phase was science fiction, no? But now there are several labs that can, 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 can control it and they use it now for control. The reason why we want to do things with few cycle laser pulses is because you can apply very strong laser fields before inducing dielectric breakdown. No? So you can access what is called a non-perturbative regime of the light matter interactions, something that cannot be captured by finite order perturbation theory before breaking the material. You can apply electric fields of 0.1 to 2 volts per, Armst per, per Armstrong, are intensities of 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 13 watts per square centimeter. And what is very interesting about that regime is that if you look at the light matter interactions, it becomes comparable with the strengths of chemical bonds. So now you can use your laser fields to dress your material and completely distort its electronic structure and then create a novel laser dress material with effective properties that can be very different from what would you observe near equilibrium. Now, these laser fields obviously give you control on a femtosecond to a, to, on a femtosecond time scale because the whole laser field is a few femtoseconds. But very importantly, they also give you control on an attosecond time scale. And the reason for this is because your whole control doesn't depend when you do resonant physics, continuous wave, what, the, what you care about is the air is the envelope of your laser field. But for these very strong laser fields, what you care about is the instantaneous value of the electric field. Mm -hmm. It feels the whole instantaneous value of the electric field. And now your control may not be to, due to the whole laser field, but maybe, for example, because of your field, because your field is very intense right here, and your control may be just because of this peak of the laser field. And because of that, you can now control electrons on atosecond second time scales. <clears throat> For reasons that I care very much about, this gives you very large stark effects, stark effects um, strong enough to take dielectrics, for example, if you silica glass into a metal for a very short period of time. It's a very large effect. Now, the main control in these experiments is controlling this carrier envelope phase. And um, what you do when you, care, you control the carrier envelope phase, this is a plot of the laser field for different carrier envelope phases. And you can see that if just by tuning the carrier envelope phase, I can have a field that, for example, looks, it's, an, it's symmetric with respect to time inversion right there. Or you can have a, a field that is, let's see, this works. I have to. Or you can have a, 
a field that has a, that is anti-symmetric with respect to time inversion. And because you're changing the temporal symmetry of the field, you're also changing the degree of laser-induced symmetry breaking that you're generating. So just by changing the scary envelope of phase, this gives you control over the directionality and magnitude of the curves. Okay. So I will claim that the first proposal to use the subcycle structure of light to control currents along nano junctions was done by me in collaboration with Paul as a PhD student. No? Eventually, this was 2007, and there were many unknowns at this point. Eventually, this led to an experiment, an experiment that changed my life, the, uh, the experiment Ferenc Krauss, in which they induced currents along gold silica gold nano junctions using these few cycle laser pulses. Then, after that experiment emerged, we spent maybe three, maybe four years doing simulation work trying to understand every nook and crack of that experiment, and then uh, trying to connect it with the original proposal that we had in 2007. And it turned out that the, 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 the main mechanism was about the same. Okay. And since then, there has been significant experimental and theoretical work in this area. People have now used a uh, light to induce currents along graphene-based junctions. This is my main collaborator, Peter Hommelhoff. People now use these type of schemes to do STM imaging, but on an ultra-fast time scale. No? Um, People now use gold nanostructures to shape light and then use very weak fields to do a strong field effects. <clears throat> we have now developed these schemes as a way to measure electronic decoherence directly through a purely electronic observable. Yeah. So I think there are many good things happening right now in this area. So what I would like to tell you about today, it's a collaboration, perhaps one of the greatest collaborations of my life between the group of Peter Homerhoff, the experimental group of Peter Homerhoff, and in particular two PhD students, Tobia Bulaki and Kristen Heide, and my group and the hero, the computational hero of the group uh, was Antonio Garzón that did all the simulations that I'm going to show you now. All right. So here's the hypothesis, and this is something, this is the way that I like to do science. We start with a hypothesis. So the hypothesis is that if you have an electric field of light that is anti-symmetric with respect to time inversion and few cycle laser pulses, for that, you need a carrier envelope phase of five halves. You will generate real charge carriers, and I will explain what this means. And if your field is symmetric with respect to time inversion, and for which you need a carrier envelope phase of zero, you will generate virtual charge carriers, and I'll, I will also explain what this means. Okay, so by real charge carriers, um, what we mean is the regular photoexcitation. I come in with my laser field. I create electron hole pairs, yeah? Because the laser field has a low temporal symmetry, I give a kick to those electron hole pairs. Electrons will move in one direction, holes will move in the other one. They will travel to the gold electrode and they will co be collected to form a current. Yeah, that's, that's, it. That, that's essential idea. But the main thing is that these excitations survive after the laser pulse. I excite them with my laser field and they remain, a, the system remains excited uh, a, once that laser field is on. The virtual charge carriers are different. The virtual charge carriers are, the idea is as follows. So you see this laser field, it's more intense for positive amplitude than for negative light. You know? And now what the laser field is doing is that it's creating a polarization response in your system. You get this even in non resonant processes. You know? So you're driving your electronic cloud, but you will drive it more strongly in one direction than in the other one. You know? And now, if you didn't have gold electrodes, this is, this is a non resonant phenomenon. And without the gold electrodes, what will happen is that once your laser field is done, this effect will just go away, yeah? Uh, so in a way, you, sure, you get laser-induced symmetry breaking during the laser field, but it's due to virtual charge carriers because at the end of the day, you, you don't excite them. So this is similar to the idea that when you're driving with a laser field, you populate excited states of your system transiently. And if you have a non-resonant process, that population just, will just go to zero because you don't have any, uh, any, any resonant processes to transfer effective energy from the, from, from, the, from the laser to the material system. Okay. But now, if you connect it to gold electrodes, what happens is that you're shaking this electronic cloud, your electrons will move more in one direction than the other one. And remember that this is a nonlinear effect, so small changes in the intensity can have a very, very large effect on the polarization. And now they will hit the gold electrodes. And once they are there, they get to the gold electrodes, they get trapped by the gold electrodes and then they'll come back and then form a current, a real current with real charge carriers. Okay. There was some evidence for this hypothesis. 
the first evidence um, was a symmetry analysis that we did here with Paul, in which um, this is for continuous wave laser pulses and closed systems, um, in which we showed that if a field was symmetric with respect to time inversion, you could not generate any net momentum that would survive time averaging. Yeah? And for me, that meant that no real carriers were possible. And we also showed that if your field was anti-symmetric with respect to time inversion, you could, uh, you could not generate net dipoles that would survive time averaging. And for that, this meant to me that no virtual carriers were possible. But there were problems. This analysis was for a continuous wave pulse in a closed system, while the experiments are done with few cycle laser pulses, which are very different than continuous wave pulses, and in a manifestly open system because you're, you're driving currents. Yeah. The other piece of evidence that we had were two experiments. There was the group, the experiment of Ferenc Krauss. This is gold, silica gold. And the main thing is that this nano junction is 50 nanometers, very small. And what they measure is the amount of charge that they extract as a function of the care envelope phase. And you see that it's oscillatory with the care envelope phase, but the maximum is right here at zero. The maximum, that, the maximum charge that you extract, you extract it as a phase of zero. And um, right at pi halves, which will be here, they get not, no, no net charge. And what, what, I'm, what, I'm look, what I'm pointing out is the, is the black line. That's the one that we should be looking at. Okay. There were also experiments in graphene nanostructures. And these were uh, related, but very different in the sense that instead of being 15 nanometers, it was a five micrometer nanojunction. And these were done by Peter. And what they were doing, what they, they like to plot is that they like to plot the current and radially, they increase the amplitude of the, of the laser field from zero to one to two to three volts per nanometer. And they plot the maximum of the current and they can measure the phase in which, at which they, can, they do that current. And you see that the maximum current is at the phase of pi halves or three pi halves, but at the like carrying envelope phase of zero and pi, they get very little, okay. So two very different, two very related experiments with a very different signature for the maximum of the control in the care envelope phase. Okay, so um, we attended this meeting, the quantum control meeting, which is probably one of the, my, my, the main meetings. We had just emerged from three or four years of simulation work, uh, understanding the silica experiments, the Ferenc Krauss experiments, and the group of Peter was getting ready to uh, publish their paper on graphene. And then we realized that we were talking about the same thing, but they were doing experiments and we were doing simulations. And we sat down in an afternoon and we realized that there was something interesting happening here. We formulated the hypothesis and this led to a many years, many years of collaborations with them, trying to match the experimental measurements in, in Erlangen with the theory calculations at Rochester. Okay. In order to capture these effects, you need a method that not only gives you the quantum dynamics in the presence of laser fields of, in bulk matter. You know, in this context is graphene. We cannot do graphene, we do graphene nano ribbons. But you also need something that captures what is, where is happening at the interface. You know? There are several calculations in this field that consider the junction as bulk solids. You know? In my opinion, all those calculations are missing all the interfacial effects. You know? And um, they give you a partially a, a, an incomplete picture of the actual quantum dynamics. So the right method to do this type of processes are the methods that have been developed by the quantum transport people, in particular the time dependent non-equilibrium green functions methods, because you are able to um, solve the Liouville von Neumann equation of your material in the presence of a driving field. And then you can take into account the effect of uh, trapping and injecting charge through these auxiliary terms in the equations of motion. Perhaps the best methods that have been developed that are out there were the ones, are the ones or the most efficient ones are the ones developed by Wang Ho Chen and this is what we use. Okay. So let me show you three years of simulation work in one slide. Okay, so this is the electric field as a function of time. And what I'm plotting here is the charge that you extract as a function of time. So it's not the current, it's the integrated current. I'm taking the current and the integrating it over time. And I'm doing a carrying envelope phase of pi halves here and a carrying envelope phase of zero. And what Antonio did is that he, um, he, he did calculations with graphene nanoribbons, metallic, with different lengths of 21, 42, and 85 nanometers, so longer and longer junctions. And let me just focus first on the current envelope phase of pi halves. So in this case, you see charge during the pulse is moving up and down, yeah? It's, sorry, it's side to side, no? So it just means you're shaking your electronic cloud. Some electrons go into, into the electrodes, but eventually they go back. 
But once your laser pulse is zero, you get no charge extracted. It goes right at zero. Once your pulse goes away, what you get is charge that increases essentially linearly with time, yeah? So basically what that is telling you is that you've created an electron wave packet, an electronic wave packet with your laser field, and that electronic wave packet is now traveling to the gold electrode and it's being collected, which is giving you an increase in charge. But once that electron wave packet hits the, 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 the gold graphene interface, some of it bounces back, yeah? And because it bounces back, you see this, this oscillatory structure in the charge and eventually it settles to a finite value. If you go from a small junction to a large junction, what you see is that the larger the junction, the, 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 the bigger the effect because your photoactive area is increasing. But you also see that these oscillatory structures become faster when you have smaller junctions, simply because it takes less time for the, your electron wave packet to travel back and forth in your junction. Okay, so the magnitude of the effect increases with length and all the charge that you extract is after the laser pulse. So this is what we typically would we would call real charge carriers in the sense that I'm generating excitations that survive after the laser fields and then I'm collecting it by the gold electrons. Okay. Now let me focus on the carrier envelope phase of zero. Um, so here is the same idea: charge as function of time, different lengths, and what I see is that all the effect, all the symmetry breaking happens during the laser pulse. Yeah. After the laser pulse, nothing happens. No. So I am just shaking my electrons. I'm turning them into a current because I get a, a, a net polarization in the problem. But all that effect happens during the laser pulse. After the laser pulse, nothing happens. So this is what we call real, this is what we call the virtual charge carriers. And very importantly, this effect is independent of length because it just it's because it's an interfacial effect. If your junction increases in size, the effect is approximately of the same magnitude. So if this whole thing is correct, what we should see is that if we go from a small junction to a bigger junction, for the small junction, these interfacial effects, this virtual charge carrier should be important. While for the longer junction, these real charge carriers should be, become dominant because this effect becomes bigger and bigger and bigger as the, as the system size increases. Okay. Is the charge collected at one electrode? At both electrodes. It's a sum. Yeah, so it's so in your term you will have the current at the left minus the current at the right, yeah, electrode, and then you're integrating over time to get the charge, the net charge that passes through the junction. Okay, so it's, a net. Huh? it's a net charge passing through the junction. Yes. So yeah, so we, I'm not showing you what happens at each of the electrodes. I'm showing you the net, the net effect. Okay. So, so if this whole thing is true, what we should see is that as we increase the system size these virtual charge carriers should become more important while these real, sorry, these real charge carriers should become more important while these virtual charge carriers will become, will not change very much with length. And then we should see that these, the phase of the control should go to pi half. And okay, so let's, let's see how this looks. I'm sorry, the wrong button. So this is the experiment exactly that they did at their length. And so what um, in particular, the hero here is Toby. Um, so what they did is that they created the junction with one micrometer in length, two micrometers in length, and five micrometers in length. And they measured these currents. And again, they have these radial plots in which I'm plotting the intensity of the current and the arrow tells you where the peak of the current is. And what you see is that for very large junctions, the peak of the current is at a phase of pi halves. This is what they have seen before. But as they make the junction smaller, the peak of the current starts to shift more and more toward pi or zero, whatever you want to see. So what you're seeing right here is a change in the mechanism between real charge carriers for larger junctions to virtual charge carriers for the smaller junctions. No? Okay, so we were very excited about this because we had figured out that there were two mechanisms to induce currents and that we could disentangle these two mechanisms because, and, and address them individually just by changing the carrier envelope phase. So we sent it to a nice journal and then Toby when we said that in the last paragraph said that because he had control over these two mechanisms that he could, could he could create logic gates that operated on an ultra fast time scale. But I think he wanted to get beyond the editor, no? And the editor said, okay, that's that's phenomenal, that's super exciting. Why don't you show me that that's that that's the case? So he closed his door and three months later or two months, 
three months later, he arrived with this. So what, what did he do? He had a junction. This is one of the larger junctions, the five micrometers. And he put a laser right in the middle, A, that will induce these real charge carriers. And he will put a laser right at the interface, B, that will induce this virtual uh, charge carriers. And now he could choose the phases, for example, the phase of A to be pi halves or minus pi half. If it's pi halves, it will move in one direction, say the right. And if it's minus pi half, it will move in the, the current will be in the opposite direction. And for B, he chose the phase to be either pi halves in which nothing will happen because it's an interfacial effect. Um, while for a, a phase of zero, you will get current in that direction in this particular example. Okay, so he could have situations in which, for example, the currents will, this one will go to the right and this will be zero. And this corresponds to this particular current in this plot that plots for technical reasons, the absolute value of the current. Or he could have situations in which the currents both cancel out and this will be this particular value. Or he will have situations in which the current goes to the left, you know, like this and so on and so forth. Okay, so now, you can assign a logical value to the phase of the laser field. So you can say that if your phase for A is by half, I will assign it a logical value of zero. And for B, if it's by half, I will assign it a logical value of zero. And um, if it's minus by half for A, I will assign it a logical value of one. And if it's um, zero for B, I will assign it a logical value of one. And then you can have an outcome of this, which is the current. And the current, if, you, if it's positive and greater than center threshold, you say that it has a logical value of one and otherwise it's zero if it's negative or if it's below that threshold. And then you quickly realize that you can have now a logic gate, yeah, in this, in this particular case, an OR gate. Um, but the twist is that this logic gate operates at the femtosecond time still. You know? So in, in essence, this is the fastest logic gate or information processing that, that has been created. And because of that, uh, we got this paper into nature, which was very, very exciting for us. Okay. So let me conclude this part. The dynamics of electrons can be controlled in ultra fast time scales with few cycle laser pulses with stable carrier envelopes. These currents, there are two contributions, one coming from what we call real uh, charge carriers and another one coming from the virtual charge carriers. These two contributions, you can disentangle them and address them individually just by burying the carrier envelope, uh, the carrier envelope phase for the driving lasers. And because you have this with this augmented control landscape, you can now develop logic gates that operate at femtosecond time scales. And in fact, we told you we did all possible logic gates in this setup. A more personal perspective of what this has meant for me, you see, this for me started like the dream of a graduate student, many years of work put into this proposal um, that eventually led to very exciting experiments. These experiments led us to do better theory of how to capture them. And eventually, because of our understanding to this better theory, this led us to the discovery of new phenomena and new technologies. No? So it has been a long, long process. No? Okay. So let's see, how much time do I have? Maybe 20 minutes or something like this? Yeah, we can finish later. So we can always do that. Uh, okay, so I only had 40 minutes for the talk because we started at 1.10, at 11.10. All right, let me see how much, let, let me try to get, let me, let me try to get to, to this other topic, which is, I want to tell you about the analog quantum simulation of chemical dynamics. So I don't think I need to motivate to describe that chemistry is a dynamical science. Um, as we look at chemical reactions, we look at the dynamics of electrons and nuclei according to the rules of quantum mechanics, and in particular, the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And, and as people in this room know much better than me, the, the problem with quantum dynamics is that the computational cost in, of doing quantum dynamics increases exponentially with system size, and you can see this. This is uh, you can see this in many ways, but you can um, you can see this many body problem. For example, if you ask the question of the memory needs just to store the wave function. So if you have a wave function in the dimensions, and you say that you're going to um, represent that wave function in a grid, and that grid will have a hundred points per direction. And you just look at the memory needs for this as the number of dimensions increases. And so for one dimension, you need 100 points. For three dimensions, you need 100 to the three, and so on and so forth. And you just calculate the memory. And you can really quickly see 
that beyond maybe four or, or five dimensions, there is no computer that can store that wave function just in memory. It's just one aspect of the many body challenge. Um, and for this reason, there have been many methods that have been developed in quantum dynamics. Uh, I mean, Professor Capral has, has, has pioneered the mixed quantum classical methods. No? Um, the people have here have worked in the split operator, multiple spawning, path integrals, volume, and exact factorization, the HUM, MCTDH, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and what I've been interested for now three years or so is in an interesting alternative, which is um, instead of trying to do the dynamics in a classical computer, what we want to do is to get the, the chemical dynamics of interest and then map these chemical dynamics into a highly controllable quantum hardware and then let nature do the computations. Um, the problem, instead of the computational part, the problem becomes the map. No. How to establish that map? That's, that's, that, that's, that, uh, that's the problem. The advantage of the analog simulation over digital quantum simulation is that um, it doesn't require a universal quantum computer. No? Uh, so the perspective right now is that in the near term, um, um, we, we will be able to do analog simulation. No? It has a possible route to quantum advantage. No? Um, so um, there are many good things and I'll, I'll tell you about our, our perspective. Now, the idea of doing analog simulation is not new. Uh, by any means of the imagination. For example, this is an orrery, and this is essentially an analog, analog simulator of celestial motion, in which you crank this lever, and it tells you how all these planets align to, to one another. So it's a very specific machine for a very specific purpose, no? but it, it allows you to get all this information that you're interested in. Or for example, uh, when you do hydrodynamics, sometimes computer simulations are not accurate enough, not realistic enough, and then we do analog simulations through wind tunnels in which we get a model of what we want to do and then replicate the conditions as close as possible to, 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 to the realistic. Okay. So the problem, the target problem for us is, has been the dynamics of open quantum systems. And uh, this is a collaboration with Andrew Jordan and John Nicola at the University of Rochester. And the hero of this story is Chang Woo Kim, who is now an assistant professor in Korea. And so we divide our system into energy, into we divide our universe into uh, degrees of freedom of interest, in particular electrons and excitons, while our environment will be a bath of thermal phonons. No? And it's the system bath interaction that leads to the decoherence and, and the dissipation. So this is the problem that we want to deal with. And the way that we are going to do this is that we are going to map the system energy levels into what are called gate-defined quantum lots. And we are going to map the environment that you can describe as a, a collection of harmonic oscillators with a given spectral density into an array of quantum electronic circuits no? with, um, with, with tunable couplings to the system into a concept that we call the quantum bath synthesizer, no? in which we just use um, this, this type of couplings to modify how the environment is, is coupled to the system. Okay. The, the particular platform that we chose is what are called semiconductor quantum dots. These are not the quantum dots of chemistry. These are the quant this is what they how these are done is that you have a two dimensional you have a, a semiconductor stru structure, and then at right at the interface you get a two dimensional electron gas, and then you cool it down, and then you deposit electrodes at the surface. So th those green and blue things are electrodes, and through these electrodes you apply a voltage a potential. And now you can get wells no, and barriers in the two-dimensional electron gas. And people have been very good about this. And they can, for example, deposit one electrode in one well in each well, or a one or, or two electrodes or three electrodes. It's a controllable, it's a very it's a highly controllable system. So it's a highly controllable Hamiltonian in the sense that I can shape the, the depth of these wells and I can also shape the barriers between wells. It has sufficiently long coherence times to enable quantum simulation. It can couple electrically to a controllable quantum environment. And this is, this is very important because electrical coupling is much simpler than, for example, inductive coupling. And this electronic structure can be controlled through what is called a detuning factor. And this detuning factor essentially is um, the energy, the difference in energy between having, okay, so the bread and butter is what is called a double well quantum weld in which you have two dots with two electrons. And this detuning is the difference in energy between having each electron in each well, E11, minus having a one the two electrons in one of the wells. 
And the way that you control this is by manipulating the depth of the left dot epsilon L with the left with the depth of the right dot epsilon R. Okay. So these are cryogenic experiments. They operate in temperature something like millikelvin, no, 60 millikelvin will be temperature. But the type of dynamics that we care about uh, is essentially room temperature dynamics in chemistry. No? So there is a very large difference in temperature between the temperature that we care about and the temperature at which these operate. And that ratio could be something like 10 to the five. No? So in order to be able to do this map, what needs to happen is that the energy levels of chemistry, they need to be scaled by this ratio. No? So the energies will be a gamma times smaller, no? and the simulation time will, will also be gamma times smaller. No? So if we are thinking about something like a, a femtosecond type of simulation, then in the simulator, in the actual experimental setup, it will, the, the actual simulation time, that femtosecond will have to be multiplied by this factor gamma, will be, which will be 10 to the five. And now with that idea in mind, you can take a look at what are the type of requirements for chemical dynamics, for example, of photosynthetic complexes, and what that means in terms of the experimental setup. And then you realize that by the typical ratio of 10 to the five, you are right in the regime in which the experiments can operate effectively. Okay. Now, the problem that we are going to focus on is one in which we have two dots with two electrons. And in that problem, there are five states, two, tip, two singlets and three triplets. The two singlets will be ones in which in either both electrons are different dots with opposite spin, or both electrons are in the same dot with the, with the opposite spin. These two singlets hybridize, no? Um, and in particular, they hybridize, the, the degree of hybridization is controlled by the bearer, this bearer, and that bearer is called what is called the tunnel coupling. So this is the energy of that singlet state as a function of the detuning, and that hybridization right there is determined by this tunnel coupling. And there are three triplet states, the triplet minus, triplet zero, and triplet plus. So five states, we need two. So you have to choose. No? Um, and depending on what you choose, the, the requirements of your simulator will be very, will be, can be very different. So we choose singlet zero, uh, the ground state singlet, and triplet minus uh, for, for our simulators. And every other math, other, every other level in the simulator will be an spectator state. We don't, we don't want to deal with them. So now our target molecular Hamiltonian will be something that looks like this, in which uh, this is the excited state, that's the ground state, that's the energy difference, and then we have some coupling between them. The energy difference between the two levels is easy to achieve. You can control, um, you can control that energy difference through the detuning, and, and you can also control it by applying a magnetic field that shifts these energy levels of the triplet states. So that's, that's easy. But in order to get these off-diagonal couplings, something that connects the singlet zero with the triplet minus, you need a magnetic field gradient along the direction of growth of the, of, of the quantum dots. And this is the reason why we put this magnetic field gradient. So each dot has a difference, a, a different quantum dot along that X direction. Okay. Just as in regular simulations, you have parameters, for example, the accuracy of your simulation. In these analog simulations, we also have simulation parameters and in particular, there is this quantity called the simulation sensitivity. And the simulation sensitivity tells you how much the energy difference between the two simulator states, singlet zero and triplet minus, changes with the detuning, that difference in energy between the left and the right dot. Depending on your simulator sensitivity, their physical requirements for the, for the simulator can be very different. So this is a target feature of the simulator. So now, once you choose your simulator sensitivity and your tunnel coupling, which is also something that you have a choice, now, given <coughs> parameters for your molecular Hamiltonian, I can tell you how to choose the detuning, the average magnetic field, and the magnetic field gradient in order to map any, 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 any two-level system um, that, that, that you care about. Okay. So now, we have to work about the environment. And so the question is, why quantum electronic circuits? Um, so when you have a, an electronic circuit that has a capacitive coupling and an inductance, it turns out that you can store charge in the capacitor uh, proportional to the charge. You can store energy in the capacitor proportional to the charge squared, and you can store energy in the in inductance in the inductor proportional to magnetic flux. 
So you see, this looks exactly like a harmonic oscillator. And in fact, this charge and flux are canonically conjugated variables. And people in condensed matter physics know this very well. We've been learning about this. So if you, this behaves exactly like a harmonic oscillator. And if you cool it low enough to low enough temperatures, it behaves like a quantum harmonic oscillator. Where now the position will be the magnetic flux, the momentum will be the charge, the mass with the capacitance and the frequency is determined by the ratio between the, the inductance and the capacitor. Okay, so what's the dynamics? Under relatively general conditions, we can think of environments in chemistry as collections of harmonic oscillators. No? Even for, for things that are unharmonic, and this is the reason for this is because um, what you care about is how that environment responds to the influence of the system and that response can be harmonic, even if the environment can be very complicated. So you can think about it as a collection of harmonic oscillators. And now we will map this into a race of quantum electronic circuits. Now, those are arrays of quantum electronic circuits because they are, they are quantum harmonic oscillators. They will lead to zero point fluctuations of the charge. And if you have zero point fluctuations of the charge, and you just connect that quantum bath synthesizer to just one of the dots, what this will do is that it will lead to fluctuations, to quantum fluctuations of the depth of that say left dot. And through that quantum fluctuations of the depth of the left dot, it will lead to quantum fluctuations in the detuning, and this will lead to the phasing and dissipation, yeah? Okay. So if you look at the spectral density of this type of circuits, well, I mean, when you have very sharp circuits, you get very, sharp peaks in the spectral densities. But now if you introduce a resistance, what happens to that peaks is that they get broadened. No? And now with this um, uh, LCR circuits or RLC circuits, now you can think about having, for example, the spectral density of a chemical environment, which is a complicated thing with many peaks at high vibrations and a low frequency vibration. It's, a it's very complicated. And you can decompose it in terms of um, circuits operating at different colors. And what we have done is that given a spectral density that you have targeted in, I can tell you how to choose the impedance of the circuit in order to match it. No? Okay. So then comes the question of how, how well does this work? So, so we did em emulate the simulator with the five levels using the hierarchical equation of motion for the connoisseurs using low temperature corrections. And um, what I'm plotting here is the population inversion. We start in the excited state and we see how the population goes down for different simulation conditions, the fidelity of the simulation and the leakage. And you can see that you can choose conditions in particular um, simulation sensitivity and tonal coupling in which the, the dynamics that you get in your simulator, which are the color lines, get very close to the target dynamics, which is the black. No? So it can be highly accurate. When you see that it fails, is because your population is leaking out of the simulator space. So you have five levels and you have only two that form part of the simulator. And when population leaks out of those states, that's when it fails. So for example, this red one, which is the worst simulator in that case, is because you see that if you look at, at fidelity, the fidelity is decreasing and is mostly because you have leakage into other, into these spectator states. Okay, so um, we actually tested the whole in the whole parameter space. And here, what I'm showing you is the fidelity, the minimum fidelity um, as a function of sensitivity and tonal coupling. And without noise, what you see is that you can get sensitivities that are very large and tonal couplings that are very large. This will be the, the upper blue line here. And those are the ones that will give you the better efficiency. But now you will ask the question, okay, you know what? These quantum nodes are pretty noisy. Will this analog simulator work in the presence of the natural environment of the system? So we included the noise and this is what I'm showing you right here. So with noise, the simulation is worse, of course, than without noise, but still the, sensi the fidelities here, even in the presence of noise are larger than 99%. So it's pretty good, no? And then there is an optimal sensitivity and an optimal tonal coupling for this particular problem that leads to the most accurate simulation for this particular problem that we deal with, which is simple, is a drudel lorentz spectral density. Okay. In terms of experimental requirements, what do we need? We need a coherent double quantum dot and spin charge hybridization. That we know how to do. Spin charge hybridization, that means that we are using this singlet, triplet, minus states. Yeah? We need large local magnetic fields. That we also know how to do. 
we need quantum resonators. That means these electronic circuits interacting with the quantum dots. This is where the, the experiments are. This is what they're trying right now. And we need arrays of high impedance quantum circuits for color. And in particular, we need about a hundred, one to a hundred per color. No? This is a challenge. No? There is nothing impossible here. No? It's possible with current technology, but it's still experimentally challenging. Okay. So let me summarize. Uh, we develop a useful map for the analog quantum simulation of two level molecules in interaction with a thermal environment. The model parameters can be experimentally tuned. It fully captures the decoherence due to fully quantum harmonic environments of arbitrary complexity. Um, it can go beyond Lindblad, Redfield, and even the hierarchical equation of motion treatments of the dynamics of open quantum systems. And the reason why I say that it goes beyond the, the HEOM is because the HEOM has a really hard time computational uh, to capture environments that are very complex. The more features they have, the more complicated the dynamics becomes. Okay, so with that, let me thank you for your attention. Take my group at the, at, at the University of Rochester. It's really an amazing gang, the NSF for funding, and uh, I thank also my collaborators, yeah.